In this video, we're going to examine a reaction involving nucleophilic addition to a carbonyl group with great practical synthetic utility that converts a ketone or aldehyde into an alkene by replacing the CO double bond with a CC double bond. It's known as the Wittig reaction, and it opens the door to new synthetic possibilities, allowing us to replace C double bond O with C double bond C. In that sense, it's the reverse of ozonolysis, and it allows us to go from the carbonyl world to the alkene world. There's an interesting reactive intermediate involved in the Wittig reaction that I want to touch on first. It's known as an ilid. And ilids contain a negatively charged atom, which is typically carbon, adjacent to a positively charged atom that's typically a hetero atom. Phosphorus, sulfur, etc. And third row elements are typical here, although second row elements can also be found in ilids. And so we have this general structure here, and we can think of the Y atom, typically carbon, as a kind of nucleophile. It's got negative charge. If it's carbon, it's often got a lone pair. But paradoxically, Y is also kind of an electrophile at the same time, because the X plus heteroatomic group, if that heteroatom is relatively electronegative, right, something like sulfur, that kind of wants to depart with a pair of electrons. It wants to act as a leaving group. So Y is electrophilic at the same time. This is sort of the paradox of illids and gives rise to all of their interesting addition type chemistry. So I wanted to look here briefly at three important types of illid reactive intermediates, and we're going to focus in on the phosphonium illid, which is most relevant to the Wittig reaction in the remainder of this video. So in the ammonium illid, we see N plus adjacent to a C minus. So we have that nucleophilic carbon with its negative charge, but also a potential leaving group in the ammonium group. A similar pattern can be seen in the sulfonium illid, where we have this positively charged sulfur group that can act as a leaving group next door to a nucleophilic carbon. And in the phosphonium illid, we've got the same thing going on over here. Now notice, particularly in these latter two structures, there's an alternative resonance form in which there's a carbon-sulfur double bond. We generate that by pushing the lone pair on carbon into a pi bond, or a carbon-phosphorus double bond. And similar electron flow is involved here to generate that CP double bond. And so these illids are sort of alkene-esque in a way, right? They've got some double bond character, not a ton, but some, between carbon and the heteroatom. So they're alkene-esque, and this suggests that they can participate in addition reactions. And this is the essence of the Wittig reaction, addition of a phosphonium illid to a ketone or aldehyde, leading ultimately to an alkene and a phosphine oxide. The oxygen in the carbonyl group ends up linked to phosphorus, which forms very, very strong bonds to oxygen. The Wittig reaction involves the treatment of a ketone or aldehyde with a phosphonium illid. We'll talk about where this reactive intermediate comes from. Generally, we start with a phosphine, PR3, and treat that with an alkyl halide, and then with a base. We'll touch on that in a second, but for the time being, I want to focus on the nucleophilic addition reaction in particular, the addition of the phosphonium illid to the ketone or aldehyde. This leads to an alkene, and we can see in this reaction scheme that what appears to have happened is replacement of the carbonyl oxygen with a CH2 group in this particular case, that CH2 group coming from the carbon side of the phosphonium illid. So the two R groups here derived from the ketone are sort of the electrophilic half here is one way to think about this, and the CH2 group is in the nucleophilic half. The carbon of that illid, recall, is nucleophilic. A byproduct of this reaction is triphenylphosphine oxide, where this oxygen came from the oxygen built into the ketone originally. And this PO double bond is very strong, and this drives this reaction to products. Now, to begin appreciating the mechanism of the Wittig reaction, I think it's helpful to consider the distribution of electrons in the C double bond O and C double bond P bonds that we find in these species. And recall that there's a good resonance form of the phosphonium illid with negative charge on carbon and positive charge on the phosphorus. We already know from prior discussions of carbonyl compounds that the CO double bond is polarized like this with positive charge on the carbon and negative charge on the oxygen. And so what happens in the Wittig reaction is bonding between the carbonyl carbon and the illid carbon and the carbonyl oxygen and the illid phosphorus. And the mechanism is most likely pericyclic. If you look out online, you may see stepwise mechanisms for the Wittig reaction. It's actually a bit unclear how the reaction operates. It can depend on the specific structure of the illid and the reaction conditions. But just as a general 
thing to keep in mind, thinking of this as a kind of 2 plus 2 cycloaddition, I think is, is helpful. With electron flow like this, the CO pi electrons heading to a PO bond, and the CP pi electrons heading into a CC bond like this. The result is a four-membered ring via a 2 plus 2 cycloaddition, and to get to the final products, we'll notice that the alkene atoms are over here on the left, and the atoms of triphenylphosphine oxide are here on the right. And so what needs to happen here is a retro 2 plus 2 reaction that looks like this. This releases the alkene product as well as the triphenylphosphine oxide. So this is a pretty typical mechanism of the Wittig reaction showing how essentially what has happened here is that the oxygen of the carbonyl group and the CH2 group in the illid have changed places via a 2 plus 2 followed by a retro 2 plus 2.